We are so grateful to have this incredible community with us this morning. I want to begin by welcoming and thanking a few guests who are with us today. I'm going to begin by announcing our Daughters of Greatness who are in the room. I'm going to ask them all to stand and then we'll give them a round of applause at the end. With us today are Alice Houston, Dr. Brandi Kelly Pryor, Karina Berea, Sadiqa Reynolds, Teresa Reno Weber, Marta Miranda Straub, and of course, Mrs. Lani Ali. Please stand. going to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors and our corporate members. I want to say, you know, the Ali Center cannot be successful, cannot do the work that we do without the support of our community. So with sincere thanks and gratefulness in our hearts, I'd like to thank all of you and we'll hold our applause to the end because there's a whole lot I'm going to go through today. First of all, our impact sponsors, the Family Scholar House, Fifth Third Bank, Gilead, the Glenview Trust Company, Amber Holleran, Hanover College, uh, HJI Supply Chain Solutions and Alice Houston, iHeartMedia, Mary Casey and the Kentucky Financial Group, Nimbus, Norton Healthcare, PNC, UofL Health, WAVE, our Trailblazer sponsors, 21C, ADP, Bellarmine University, Churchill Downs, the Junior League of Louisville, Dr. Alexandra Jarosimidis, Louisville Tourism, Louisville Public Media, and Passport by Molina Healthcare, our Game Changer sponsors, Brown Foreman and Humana, and of course, our champion sponsor, Beam Suntory. Please give them all a round of applause. <laughs> this is our final Daughters of Greatness program for 2020. Uh, three, I'm not quite ready to announce our 2024 program, but I promise it's coming your way soon. But because this is our final program of the year, I want to also take a moment to thank the people that have made this possible. The Ali Center team, who is here so early in the morning every time we put one of these programs on, our catering partner, Lady Fingers, and a few people who are quietly behind the scenes making this happen, Sydney Harbin, Alan Gazaway, and Tabitha McNulty, who makes this room so beautiful every time. So if we could give them a round of applause, please. Um, and now I'd like to welcome to the stage our president and CEO, Marilyn Jackson, and past daughter of greatness, Teresa Reno Weber. Please join me. I am overwhelmed at this room. I can't thank you all enough for coming out today. Um, this is tremendous, and as many of you know, uh, I am now closing in on my second year at the Muhammad Ali Center in this incredible position. Um, I can't thank enough the community that has come out and supported our new vision. We launched our strategic plan um, last June, so it's been in the works now for almost a year and a half. And one of the pillars of our strategic plan was to better connect with the community, better connect with Louisville, better connect with the people that live here, as well as continue to do our work nationally and globally around curriculum and um, around exhibits, around conversations. And I, today when I look at this room, it is a testimony to the work that the center has done and the work that you guys and the belief that this community has in the center. And so I thank you all so much for your support. Um, you know, when, when I look at this space and I look at the people in the room, there are real conversations that are gonna happen as a result of these types of programs. Um, we all, and that's what Muhammad believed, that we all have the power to change and transform the world around us. And I believe that is his legacy, and that is what uh, the center is here to provide. So as we think about um, this program and the fact that this is our 61st Daughter of Greatness, uh, I'd like to introduce Tarina, Teresa Reno Weber, who is Daughter of Greatness, and she has some words for okay. you. Thank you, Marilyn. Man, you all are a beautiful room, I have to just say. and. Um, 
you shouldn't have probably given me the microphone because I know I'm going to announce a Daughters of Greatness work group. But first and foremost, I just have to say a moment to my sister, Adria. Where are you? Um, I am so glad to be able to be here this morning to watch you get your flowers. Um, I can't think of a better way than to have a packed house here to show you just how much our community loves and respects you and supports you and is behind you. Um, thank you. But the other thing I wanted to say was that uh, we have pulled together a Daughters of Greatness work group thanks to Marta Miranda Straub, who's been helping the Ali Center with their strategic planning over the last year. And just recently, the work group of volunteers who raised their hand, um, myself, including Barbara Sexton Smith, Carolyn Tandy, Dr. Brandy Kelly Pryor, Dr. Renee Campbell, uh, Marilyn Jackson, um, we all got together and started to brainstorm ideas to engage and celebrate the existing Daughters of Greatness beyond this breakfast. If you look at the 61 years that, or 61 events that have gone on, um, no, it's not 61 events, 61 years, but the events of Daughters of Greatness that we've had, um, there is true greatness here in Louisville. There is true greatness associated with this center. And we need to engage that sisterhood um, more and more deeply. And we are really excited about the ideas that we started to brainstorm. We're also developing criteria and processes for choosing future Daughters of Greatness and suggestions for creating a Daughters of Greatness giving circle. We have all been incredibly blessed um, and incredibly honored to be recognized by the Ali Center um, to be a Daughter of Greatness. And we wanna make sure that we are here supporting our center. Um, I think Marilyn said it so well at the last um, Daughters of Greatness, you know, there is only one Ali Center in the world and it is right here in Louisville, Kentucky. And we wanna make sure that we are doing our part for it to continue to be the community treasure that it is. So I am giving a call out to all of my fellow Daughters of Greatness. Um, we invite you to join us in this work group. Um, I believe you received one of these um, handouts when you probably walked in, and if not, we have extras. Um, if you're interested in joining us and sharing your thoughts about ways that we can better engage one another and our community and support the Ali Center, then please just fill this out. Give it to Marta, who's standing up in the middle of the room and we would love to engage you in the effort. Thank you all. All right. You know, not only is this our 61st Daughter of Greatness, but this is our highest attended Daughters of Greatness by far. I can't think of any better example to the testament to the expansive power of love, that if you give love, if you seed love, if you lead with love, that it comes back to you tenfold than this beautiful room that's here today. Um, so with love in our hearts, I am very pleased to introduce the individual who is going to introduce our next daughter, Greatness. <laughs> Do you know who that is? No. Oh. Please welcome to the podium, Adria's daughter, Brentley Rhodes. Aww. Everybody. It is pretty cool to be a daughter of the daughter of greatness. <laughs> I didn't write too much, but she's crying already. So but <laughs> to me, a daughter of greatness is a woman who, despite the obstacles of life that life throws her way, she rises to the challenge and tackles them with strength, faith, and love a woman who is selfless beyond measure, someone who is always fighting to make a change in the community and who's not afraid to walk in the power placed upon her. And it is no secret that my mom, Adria Johnson, is beyond deserving to be this nominated daughter of greatness. She is a woman who, despite the greatest heartbreak of this year, continues to keep God first and focus on his mission. She is the poster board for what it looks like to turn pain into purpose. And she is a true leader and hero. So, you know, KJ and I couldn't be more proud of you. And thank you for showing everybody what it looks like when you say love wins.
out. <laughs> I don't cry easy, but man. Thank you. I um I am my heart is so full. Let me just start there. Um the love that I feel, the love that we have felt, I just can't thank you guys enough. Um and when I found out that I got this award you know, I, I said to a few people, if I never receive another accolade in my life, this is it. Because when you think about who Muhammad was and what he stood for, and to be given an honor that says, we see those values in you and how you lead and live your life, I, I know my angels in heaven are smiling today. <laughs> So, um, and I have to, I've got all these incredibly special people here with me today. You, you saw my beautiful daughter, you've seen her, her little ones, my grandkids who are my heart. Um, my brother is here, my aunt is here, the matriarch of our family, my cousins, my best friend, who's, we've been friends for more than, gosh, yeah, long time. <laughs> My son in love Byron is here. My pastor, Philip Lindsay Hodge of Fifth Street Baptist Church, where I've been a member for over 40 years. And a woman who is like my second mother, Sharon Hodge, our first lady, is here. My team is here. And so many people out in community that just, I have the blessing of not only working aside along with you guys, but you guys are my friends. And so when the Ali Center reached out and, and kind of just gave me some guiding, you know, some guidance on how to frame remarks. You know, some of the things that they put in that email to me were, you might want to touch on what were the transformational moments in your life, good or bad, that made you say, I've got to do something. How was your upbringing and your childhood? How did that influence your work? And then why do you do the work that you do and what lights your fire? So I actually feel like I should call my brother up here. <laughs> because um, you know, our life wasn't a crystal stair by any stretch of the imagination. And when I thought back over my 52 years of existence, the first thing that I noted was the first moment in my life where I feel like I felt compassion. And I'll never forget it because I was maybe second or third grade, I was in elementary school, Bowen Elementary, and I'll never forget one of my classmates, it was cold outside, it was wintertime, and when I got to school that morning, there were all of these people hovered around her because she was shivering. And I mean shivering. And her hands were almost translucent because of how cold she was and because she clearly didn't have the right coat, the right gloves. And I'll, I just, I, I can't explain why that penetrated me and impacted me the way that it did, but I can see it like it was yesterday. And so, we fa and so again, that was a glimpse into compassion and also the compassion from strangers and to see people that surrounded her, to try and love on her and to try and make things better, right? So fast forward, um, elementary school or the end of elementary school is also when my family started to endure our hardship. And, you know, as a result of our family fracturing and my parents divorcing, it thrust us into poverty. And I mean thrust us into poverty. I know that my brothers and I, my oldest brother is not here, but it was a shock to our system. There is no other way to put the world that we had been living in and the world that we walked into into any other words but a shock to our system. It was also my first awareness of the inequities that exist. Because for the first time in my life, because of where we had to move and the conditions that we had to live in, I looked around and saw a majority of people that had the skin color of my family. And that was not 
what I had experienced when we lived when life was more comfortable and life was more stable. And I understood what it meant to live in substandard housing. I remember to this day being home from school one day. I was sick. My mother was home with me. Our utilities were cut off in the middle of winter. And she and I laid on a mattress close to where the gas stove that, cause your electricity gets cut off, not your gas, where we could try and get a little bit of the heat that was emanating out of that stove while we sat there bundled up, fully clothed, coats, blankets, and sick. And to this day, people that know me, I am terrified of mice. Why? Because they're these little bitty critters that you can kick out of the way. Because that house of horrors that we moved into made us feel like we were the guest. Because their presence was so substantial. And it was the first time I had to watch my mother, God rest her soul, swallow her pride and traipse down to the l &M building. And you have to know, I come from hardworking people. So all of the judgment that we place on people that are struggling, life happens. And it is not a character deficiency. It is not because people are making bad choices. Life happens and people are doing their best to survive because that's what we did. My brothers and I would go along with my mother and we became the recycling company. To this day, I can't stand beer. And it took me a long time to unpack that. What is it about beer? And it's not the taste that has an aversion within my spirit. It is because the smell of beer transports me back to a time when we got out of the car or walked the blocks with bags, collected those cans, and took them down to the recycling plant to make the struggle a little less severe. It was during that period that I remember, that I learned rather, that holidays aren't always happy. I'm sure you remember, Carlton, that one Christmas, we didn't get anything, or very little. And we were also at that age, because we're not quite children, we're in that kind of preteen, attitudinal, you know how it goes, right? Where we didn't have as much empathy and compassion for our mother who struggled to do her best to put what she did put under that tree. But for we as children, without the mental capacity and the emotional capacity to understand that, all we experienced was Santa didn't come our way that year. And as I look back over it now, yes, my brother said I wouldn't have it any other way. But as I look back over it now, and I remember the pain in my mother's face and in her eyes because she felt deficient and inadequate as a parent to provide for her children in the way that any parent wants to. So again, judge not. Yes, leave, we be judged. Life happened. So fast forward, well, let me back up before we fast forward. That was also the period where I began to really feel envy, not jealousy, but envy. A longing for that stability that we had once experienced as kids before lives were disrupted. I remember we would also, we would walk many times from where we lived to land tech. You remember that Carlton? Where my mother would go to clean the offices after hours and on weekends with her children in tow. I can remember to this day what that building smells like. I can remember to that day what that building looks like. But the envy, because as we cleaned these executive offices 
and you're seeing these beautiful pictures of families and children smiling, wow, you talk about envy because we were going back to a shack. So also during that period, I had my first dose of what it felt like to be made to feel shame and to be made to feel less than. I was sitting in the lunchroom, this was middle school, with some girls that I thought were my friends, and maybe they were, because you know, again, you're at that age, you don't know how to quite act right, right? We're not always nice to people. It's just a fact, right? Mean girls is a real thing, right? So, for a family that didn't have a lot, the little bit that we did have was precious to us. And I remember I had a pair of jeans, right? I don't know what brand, whatever brand was popular back then, right? And you feel better when you feel like you look better and you feel like you fit in. And so I wore these jeans a lot, partly out of necessity because I didn't have an extensive wardrobe. And I'll never forget, I was sitting at that lunch table one day and one of these girls said to me, just how many pairs of those jeans do you have? She could have stabbed me with a knife because the shame that made me feel in feeling like I had been exposed. They know about what my family is going through. They know about that struggle. And in some ways that makes me deficient. That was the first time in my life I was made to feel less than, and I said, I will never feel that way again. But that wasn't the only time I was made to feel that way. Fast forward, I thank God that we were able to lift out. I thank God that in spite of the struggle, I had two of the best parents on this planet. Wouldn't trade them for anything. And they instilled in us a strong work ethic they instilled in us a faith in God. And so I was able to keep pushing while we kept pushing as a family, while my mother kept pushing as a mother, while my father pushed as a father, and I made it to college. But I also became a 20-year-old parent in college of this beautiful woman that just stood before you. And so my next episode of being made to feel less than was when I delivered this beautiful woman. And the treatment that I received during my delivery, my labor and delivery, was nothing but savage and inhumane. So when you hear the talk about maternal health care, and the inequities and why black women experience and have higher rates of mortality, that could have been me. I almost died after giving birth to my daughter because of the complications that I endured afterward. But the treatment that I received because I was young, poor, and black made me feel defenseless for the first time in my life, made me feel powerless, again, because I was young, poor, and black. And when I had her, because I was just a junior in college, I found out what a wick line was. I was in line for those same benefits that my mother needed for a period of time for us to subsist. And I was drawn back immediately into that shame. I remember finding certain grocery stores in Muncie, Indiana, where Ball State University was located, where I went to school, where I could not run into people that I knew. Because back then, you didn't have the card. You had the stamps, right? You had the undignified way that we support people in need, which is to shame them further. Yes. By making sure we stand out from the crowd and what that does to how you move 
how you navigate the relationships, how you don't let people get close to you because people are stigmatized and shame on us for perpetuating that. So when I reflect on what made me who I am, those transformational moments, that made me determined to use my time here to lift and to love. And that is why it is not okay that we don't work with a sense of urgency around these issues. That is why it is not okay that we keep leaning into the superficial, symptomatic ways of solving for what is out here. That is why you have to do the transformational, ugly, messy work that has you exhausted, has you tired, has you criticized, has you scrutinized. But that is why, because I lived that. And I know the pain. We always talk about the data and the numbers. There are people, people, they represent people that need our help and need it in a non-judgmental way and need it in a way that gives our best. Mediocrity is not acceptable. The safe route is not acceptable. So let's talk about who made me what I am. So one of the final transformational moments, and there are many, I won't say final, just the ones I'm sharing with you. When I became commissioner of DCBS and when I was at the state, I remember, you know, you're out and about, you're going to different agencies, you're going to different providers, and I went to Our Lady of Peace. My mother struggled with chronic depression and anxiety her entire life. And if I'm honest, my mother will have been gone two years in February. And the awareness and understanding of what that did to her trying to live life is something that if I'm honest, I'm still coming to grips with, right? And really understanding how that limited her, how that incapacitated her to fully be present for her family, to fully engage the way that she needed to. But when I walked in Our Lady of Peace, because I remember as a little bitty girl going to visit my mother in Our Lady of Peace. So again, life happens. And so I thank God for my mother. I thank God for my aunt, Patience Wheat, who was here, her sister, I thank God for their mother, Aline Payne Hunter, and her mother, Ora Lee Ray, and my father's mother, Aberdeen Crooms, and her mother, Ella Roberson, because these women, by societal standards, didn't have anything. But these were the richest women I know. Yes. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother, Aline Payne Hunter, her education stopped at eighth grade. She overcame an abusive relationship to go on and to pour into her children so they could pour into us, my brother, my cousins that are sitting here, so that we could be standing here. My grandmother on my dad's side, Aberdeen Crooms, she too endured an abusive relationship. And she was at a point of being so broken down 
that she was on the verge of giving her children up for adoption because she didn't think she could make it. And I thank God for Ella Robertson who said, no baby, I got you and I got those kids and we will make it and I will be your strength until you are strong enough to stand on your own. And so I'm gonna wrap up with just a couple things. I had an opportunity several years ago to visit the 9-11 Memorial. I'm sure many of you have seen that. You know how moving that is. And there's a portion in that memorial that stopped me in my tracks because it is a wall and it's got quotes. It's just a wall of quotes, not even pictures. And this quote said, she had a business suit on. Her hair was all askew. This woman stood there for what seemed like minutes. Then she held down her skirt and then stepped off the ledge. I thought, how human, to hold down her skirt before she jumped. I couldn't look anymore. Now, none of us will ever know, right, what was going through that woman's mind. But as I went on to, there was an article that was even written about this. And the article was titled, The Woman Who Jumped Courage Through Tragedy. And it talked about the person that penned this article had the exact same emotional reaction that I had. And they talked about what they took away from that but they talked about the smoothing of the skirt and what an incredible just show of courage that was in the face of immense tragedy. So as I think about my mother, my aunt, my grandmothers, my great grandmothers, these are women who consistently smoothed their skirt. Brindley, you smooth your skirt as many times as you have to in this life. And you teach that baby, Ama, to do the same. And to the men, Byron, smooth your jacket. And you teach your boys to do the same. Because life is going to throw you the unthinkable. I'm going to close with this. My beautiful board chair. Where, Ashley? Okay, I'm not sure where she is. There she is. Yeah, oh my God, you should be up here. Um, my beautiful board chair, Ashley Duncan, she said to me when she found out that I had gotten this award, she said, now I want you to know it's, it's not just because of this past year. We are celebrating you for all that you have done. But I'm gonna tell you this, it could absolutely be about this last year. Because if I am being honored for smoothing my skirt during the greatest personal tragedy that I have ever experienced in my life, and that can be a demonstration of the faith that I hold yes. because of the love that I know that God has for me in spite of, yes. then it can absolutely be about this moment. Yes. You all know that this time last year, come Sunday, we, will, we would have said goodbye to my son. Today was the actual day that we set the date for his honor walk, which was the 19th. And people have consistently said to me, how do you do it? My father raised us by saying repeatedly, God is love. If I heard it once, I heard it a million times. 
And so in the midst of saying goodbye to my buddy, first of all, he's okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah, KJ's probably zooming around here right now. Hallelujah. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to take you to church for a minute. Because I can imagine at 12.42 p.m. on November 19th, when he started climbing that stairway to heaven, and his brother, who'd been waiting, and as the family knows, KJ was the late one. So he was probably like, man, what took you so long, right? Because it's been nine days I've been waiting on you. And his grandparents were up there. And then when KJ got to see the master, are you kidding me? He is okay. So how does mama stay okay? Because I'm going to see him again. And I feel him. If you all knew what my daughter and I have experienced from his spirit, his brother's spirit, his grandparents' spirit, we are not supposed to proselytize, but my God is real. And I hope that what, whoever you serve, the God you serve, I can only pray that you experience the realness that I have. So that is how we are okay. And God commands us to trust him, to know that all things work together in spite of and we are still to see good and be good despite what is happening all around us. So I just thank you for this honor. I thank you for all of you coming out to love on me, my family today. God bless you and let's just keep doing the good work, right? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> Nobody planted a question? <laughs> Tally has a question. Oh, I was actually going to say that. It's them. Um, oh, gosh, my proudest achievement. Oh. Um, I, that's a hard one. I mean, I don't know. Maybe the proudest achievement is this room, right? Maybe the proudest achievement is all of us coming together. I, I, I'm going to have to give that some thought. I mean, there are many things I've done throughout my career that I'm proud of. I'm proud of the work that we are doing at United Way. Um, but that's a tough one because I, I also know I'm not done yet. So ask me that in another year or two. I was going to ask, how does your work that you're doing today allow you to uh, channel your experiences and to right maybe some of the wrongs that you spoke about today? I mean, I think that's just it. It's the work, right? I mean, for the first, for those that know my career history, I mean, the first 11 or so years of my career were spent in the corporate sector, and I did some intentional pivoting and was fortunate to go into local government, serve under Mayor Fisher's administration, starting under Abramson, ending under Fisher, and then go on to the state. So I, I think the work, um, because you're helping those in need, I will say specifically the work of United Way helps me to channel that because we are pushing against status quo. With I see so many wonderful board members here team members here, and it's not been an easy journey. Uh, I don't want to make this a United Way heavy, but I mean, it, people have been confused, legitimately so. People may not necessarily be in agreement with some of the ways that we have shifted, but it was with the intention to do just this, to have a greater impact in community and to really help those in a more substantial way than perhaps we historically have been. And so, I mean, that is what excites me. The policy work, I saw Man Mandy's in the house. Mandy passed the baton to Liz. 
I mean, the things that we are doing to really, again, have greater impact, that's what excites me because it takes that level of change along with those other things, but it takes that level of change to really move the needle. Same. That's right. I'm proud of you. Everybody else supports you. Uh, but you aren't Wonder Woman either. <laughs> that's why everybody, we all think she's Wonder Woman. She's the great leader, all the white qualities. But I'm glad all of you all support her. Have her back because she needs it all. So. <laughs> Spoken like a true brother. <laughs> Y'all don't leave my baby sister hanging, right? You know, we talk a lot about mental health and self-care, and I need you to make sure you take care of you. So tell us today how we can continue to support Metro United Way, and tell us a couple things that you do for self-care. We love you, and thank you. I love you guys too. So how you can help United Way, I mean, obviously time, talent, and treasure. We don't do what we do without generosity, but, but I think even bigger than that, it's be an advocate for us. We've, I mean, we, you know, I, I would be, I wouldn't be being transparent if I didn't say that we haven't taken some hits and some arrows for the changes that we've made. Sometimes it has felt like an uphill battle. Be our advocate when, and you know, and whether that's advocating and when you hear things, Look at folks, you know, help, let me clarify for you what Metro United Way is doing. Let me put you in contact with the CEO and her team so they can talk about United Way so that people aren't just led by their assumptions. Let it at least be grounded in fact. So I would say just be our advocates and encourage people to really understand this version of United Way and what we are and what we aren't. In terms of what I do for self-care, I, I mean, Brindley knows probably not even remotely enough. She said nothing, she mouthed nothing. Um, yeah, um, so, and, and she's honest. I, um, and I tell people that, I, I talk to a lot of young women when they ask me, how do you balance? I'm like, well, I'm not the poster child because I'm not doing so hot. Um, I don't know, but I, people that know me also that I've had this conversation with, and I, I recognize it and I've had this conversation with a few people close to me. I also recognize that this grief journey is a hard one. Yes, I stand strong, but please know that I am shattered, make no mistake about that. And part of my coping mechanism this past year has been to just keep going, 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 because I'm actually terrified to pause long enough and feel and absorb the loss. So y'all pray for me in that way, um, because that is just real. And I don't know, I don't know that I'm ready to deal with it, if I am honest. morning. Thank you for sharing your wonderful story. Uh, I know there's a lot of young leaders around the room. Uh, thanks again for sharing the unthinkable story about life. What's the biggest roadblock you encounter in your career and how do you overcome that? <laughs> <laughs> the biggest roadblock. Um, I mean, of course, I've experienced, I think, what many women in leadership experience as they begin to elevate, right? I mean, you know, struggling to be respected at the same degree that men are, struggling to be valued for what you bring to the table. That is very real. I've experienced it many times over in my career. Um, I think in this moment in time, we are post Breonna Taylor, post a racial reckoning. And again, if we are honest, and I am always going to be transparent and honest, pe many people are over that. Nothing to see here, nothing to see here. Didn't we fix it? We, we invested a little bit here. We did a little bit here. We created this position. And so my greatest struggle right now, quite frankly, is being a black woman at this moment in time, continuing to push for the sustained effort that is needed to really rectify things. Yes. That is the struggle. And if you translate that into an organization like United Way, 
that has gone through its own transformation and again has legitimately some lack of clarity and things that we need to lean in on, there's also some just peer resistance to a push on equity. And so being a black face, it's not an easy road. Okay, <laughs> well, I think one, um, and I've, I've had the, the opportunity to speak at Grace James ceremonies and speak to those young women that are entering into that academic institution. And some of the things that I've said to them are, are one, just reflecting on my own life, don't let what is present cloud your vision for what is possible in the future. So that is the first thing, right? This does not have to be a permanent state of affairs, whatever it is, because we are all still growing. We are all still evolving at the age of 52. I'm still figuring it out, and I still have dreams for myself. I'm not done at the CEO level. The other thing is I would say take your education seriously, right? I mean, you know, education truly is one of the great equalizers because it does give you opportunity. So try your best to do well in school, and if it's not, and whatever your career path is, just find a path and be determined and stick to it. The other thing that I would say are reach out and find women above you to mentor you and to talk to you. I, I, you know, I have been, since I stepped in the seat, I have been inundated with young women that are like, can, can I talk to you, can I talk to you? And I may not have the opportunity to establish a full-blown mentoring relationship where I can commit to so many hours each week or so many hours each month because my schedule is crazy, I can at least commit to let's sit down and have a cup of coffee, let's have a phone call, and let's do that as often as is feasible and just share with them the journey. And so you'd be surprised because the other reason I mentioned that is how I've had so many young women say to me, it, it can feel intimidating, right? To reach up to somebody and say, do you have time for me? We are people. I put my pants on the same way that you do and don't let the title fool you, right? I'm Adria first. And so don't ever be intimidated to reach out to someone and say, I would really like to just sit and learn from you and learn about your journey. And I, and I, can, I know just looking around the room at all of these beautiful women and leaders, I don't know of a single one of us that would say no. <laughs> Always gotta be Amy. <laughs> she wanted to come up here. She asked me about five times. <laughs> First of all, Dave says congratulations. Uh, thank <laughs> and thank you for all that you do for our community. And I just want to say, um, trying to keep everybody warm, sometimes that puts ourselves on fire. So I really hope you think about compassion fatigue. And my question is, if you had unlimited resources, what is the first thing that you would want to change in the, state, in the city of Louisville? Oh my gosh. Un oh, wow, that is, well, unlimited resources to put every nonprofit out of business. Yeah, because, yes, yes. I, I, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, to put all of us out of business because that funding is invested in a way that is really going to put people into thriving economic opportunity, right? Um, I, you know, and so, I mean, that is a loaded question, but that would be the goal, that we do not need to exist or maybe a very small fraction that are truly rooted in crisis response because people are actually able to live and prosper, regardless of zip code, regardless of career path, regardless of demographic, regardless of faith, ideology, you know, what, what have you. And then I would take a trip around the world and say I'm tired. <laughs> That's when I'm gonna rest, right? So Andrea, uh Speaking to um, the white women in the room, um, you, you were speaking at uh, black women in your role, it's really difficult. Speak to the white women in the room and tell uh, white women and, and men and tell us what you need from us. I, I, I mean, it's, here's what I will say, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a scenario and I think the answer will become clear. I, I, I participated in, um, I was invited to 
be part of a convening of, um, it was several black leaders were invited to this convening to intersect with a cohort of white leaders in this community that had been part of um, uh, an effort around racial equity, right? And when we were in that space, part of the conversation that came up was um, they had, at one point in time, this cohort had contemplated the idea of pinning an op-ed and becoming more outspoken around, the, again, the need for there not to be this equity fatigue and the need for there to be commitment from this community to continue that. And they were going to pin that op-ed. That op-ed has not happened. Now, I say that to say that what it's wonderful because I don't want to diminish the work that was being done in this cohort because that was intended to be very personal work, right? It was intended to be an educational opportunity for white leaders to understand these dynamics and to start spurring some ideas on where do we go from here? But walk the talk. So there has to be demonstrative action beyond just those closed doors where you all are coming out outspoken in a way that is going to make people uncomfortable because we everything has to be palatable and I, and don't and please hear me absolutely we need to be professional we need to be dipl diplomatic we need to be respectful but there is a time when we have to also be honest and there is a time when you are required to be courageous enough to stand behind what you say you are convicted around wanting to be part of the solution around and that is what i am not seeing in this community that is allyship in action My, my beautiful aunt wants to say something. And I, and I think there was a question. Mahat, okay. Adria. I am so proud of you. And I know KJ is just smiling and clapping his hands. Oh, KJ is everywhere right now. He's, he's probably so standing proud. right here. <laughs> I also know Grandma Aline, sis, Grandma Cruz. They are so proud of you. No one knows what this woman has been through. She talked about her childhood, but she's been through so much, and she reminds me so much of what my mom went through. She's so much like my mother. They have been through so much. Nobody knows, maybe one other person. But your mother and I always talked, and we said, you are going to make it, and you're going to be successful. Her belief in God, her strength in God, has really, really made this woman the woman she is, and she's going to continue to be. And I am so proud and so proud of you, Adrian.